introduction for the weekend. I'm a huge fan of the next speaker. His works helped shape my ideas while studying global health last year, so it's a privilege for me to introduce him today. Dr. Derek Summerfield is an accomplished clinical psychiatrist, currently working in an HIV mental health team, and is also extensively published. His research is fascinating, mainly focusing on the mental health of extremely vulnerable populations, such as torture victims and people living under occupation and war. He's going to continue this plenary talking about the people in partnership with people, focusing on mental health in difficult settings and how it interacts with the SDGs. Mental health is an incredibly important topic that is often not given the attention it requires. It was omitted from the Millennium Development Goals and has no specific mention in the SDGs. For this reason, we are very proud to give mental health the airtime it deserves and to have Dr. Derek Summerfield here today. Please give him a warm welcome. Again, I remember speaking at a medicine conference in Oxford years ago, and the World Health Organization, the Director of Mental Health, I'm quite critical of the World Health Organization, was there looking a bit nonplussed at my presentation. <laughs> but it's slightly ironic in, in relation to Anna's uh, pitch there that I'm here to strike a cautionary note, actually, and not if anything to play down mental health and not pump it up. We haven't got very long, but three themes, three themes, takeaway. What is health, including what is mental health, in a broken social world? What is that? <laughs> Whose knowledge counts? There's only one culture with the power to globalise its uh, knowledge base, and that's the West. We have a special ethical duty, and it seems to me a great deal of Western scholarship, and certainly in the fields I'm discussing here, um, has uh, been uh, driven by a too self-satisfied and really rather ignorant and, and complacent approach to scholarship, but hasn't really taken non-Western scholarship seriously. After all, if we say, um, if we think that our knowledge is universal, for example, if we think that, say, depression as a mental health category is applicable all over the world, even in parts of the world like Cambodia, many parts of the world, and I come from Zimbabwe, where well, there's no such thing. There's no such thing. Unless you say we know better. If we say our knowledge is universal, but local knowledge, Zimbabwe knowledge, is only applicable locally, that is an imperialist dynamic, isn't it? That is the classical imperialist dynamic. But our, our, what we think must be universal. And thirdly, can Western ideas about mental health and services um, be exported uncontroversially to the many different parts of the world where a huge range of different mentalities, social and cultural traditions, um, forms of help seeking, and definitions of a person, all forms of healing are rest on a definition of a person. Can that be done? Can that be done? So here we go. Um, we have dogs. So, 12 minutes left. This is an influential uh, series in the Lancet, which set down, uh, supported by the WHO, which set down three statements um, which are the basis for extending mental health services in the third world as part of development goals. They are, as you read them, can you read them? Can you see them at the back? Mental disorders represent a substantial, though largely hidden, proportion of the world's overall disease. Um, disease, uh, disease burden, it's largely hidden from millions of people who don't think of their problems in those ways. So who's right? Largely hidden from them. Secondly, that every, every year in the world, this is WHO, 30% of the global population will develop some sort of mental disorder. If you believe that, you come from another planet. Right? What is a mental disorder? Uh, the same people say that one in four people in Britain develop mental disorder a year. If you believe that, uh, you must be wondering why breast society is not falling down. If one in four people had a mental disorder worthy of the name, things would not be operated. The bus wouldn't arrive. <laughs> and thirdly, that there's strong evidence for scaling up of mental health services worldwide. In other words, they say there's strong evidence that our form of mental health services and our ideas about mentality and treatment can be taken around the world. This, this is nonsense. There's no strong evidence for it. And that's what I'm, um, I'm really wanting to achieve very briefly. So let's just read a paper of mine in the BMJ, which looked at this in detail. I didn't want once, but I can send it to you. How scientifically valid is the knowledge base in global mental health? And very briefly, it's a problem of validity. If you want to do research in social sciences, and especially in the sort of mental health sciences, um, assuming that's not an oxymoron, um, you need to have a method, a methodology which is valid, validity. And validity in this sense means you capture the felt realities. 
the felt worlds of those people. If I take a questionnaire that's been honed in white Western populations to capture, say, depression, and I go to Cambodia, I was there fairly recently, and give it to them, they, their questions will seem strange to them, even in translation, they may say yes to some, no to others. If that does not capture the nature of Cambodian reality, it's a nonsense. You wouldn't want to base any services on it. And this is a fundamental problem. Uh, it's an epistemological problem uh, that the WHO and those people pushing global mental health, and I've talking to some people here who are going to do masters in global mental health, they're pushing the idea that what we have discovered about mental health here in the West is applicable elsewhere. And we can uncontroversially take our mental health services, which are controversial even here. It's controversial even in Western countries whether antidepressants work or whether schizophrenics after 50 years of treatment are any closer to the rest of us than they used to be. Or any. And yet it's assumed that this can be taken out there. Very much good news for this pharmaceutical industry. Very much good news. <laughs> if you believe this, you come from another family. The WHO believes this. The WHO claims that depression, in terms of disease burden, liability, you know, is currently more burdensome, or as burdensome, as any other disease in the world of any kind. Of any kind. So they say that HIV disease, which currently has 30, 34 million prevalence, most in the South Africa, 1.8 million deaths in 2010, that that's less burdensome than this category called depression, that most of the world doesn't even recognize. Secondly, more burdensome than TB, nearly 9 million cases in 2010, and almost as many deaths as, as HIV disease, 1.4 million. Often they come together, of course, in Africa. And thirdly, even malaria, malaria, 260 million cases in 2010, two thirds of a million deaths. Are we saying that some mental health problems are more burdensome than that on the global scale? We have to understand uh, where this is. I suppose that this is me being rather ruder in this medical journal. I think that, that we should just uh, analyze what we mean by global health. The very term may be an oxymoron. Unless there's a standard universal applicable for mental health, we should be careful before we even use a phrase like global mental health. Huh? What does it mean? All systems of mental health are culturally bound, yeah? culturally determined. Western psychiatry is just one amongst many ethnic psychiatry, but the only one with the power to globalize itself, we understand that. Yeah? And this is why um, the international classifications of psychiatric problems and diseases are Western cultural documents. They're not just scientific documents, they are Western cultural documents. Here's an example of the problem. And this is one example, the only example I've chosen. In India, rural farmers um, who were persuaded by the Indian government and by Monsanto, the big farmers, the, the big um, agro, uh, agro chemical business, to switch to uh, genetically modified cotton, using having to buy renewable seed and insecticides because the local stuff uh, used to be, you know, it's been cast aside, and and now of course the uh, the seeds aren't um, are, are not resistant to Indian conditions. And these farmers have gone bankrupt, and a quarter of a nearly a quarter of a million of them have committed suicide with Monsanto insecticides in the last 20 years. A quarter of a million. The death of the small farmer, the hopes they had, the pushing, the pharmaceutical pushing, Indian government's neoliberal policies. When asked about this, the Indian government says, "Yes, we need more psychiatrists in India. You see how much depression we have. This is an issue, isn't it? If you shift focus." from the social world of the person, the broken social world, to the space between their ears, that is a political shift we have to think about. What is that? Hmm? Expert slams down to South London Mortuary, you know. The expert is 
he parachuted into a foreign city. He has everything he needs to bring with him. He doesn't need to ask the local any questions because he's already answered those questions by his methodology and what he brings and by the hopes of the sponsors here. That's a disgrace. That is a disgrace. So, where are we? Where are we? There are issues in the third world. I think that um, the, the poor people of the world, Franz Panon's wretched of the earth, direct us, not to this place for 10 areas, but to their social worlds, yeah? Which are broken, and more and more broken, and we see the tides coming over here. What do we do about that? What do we do about that? How do we, um, how do we frame health issues, but uh, somehow do not exclude these wider contexts? And that's what, for me, um, the kind of organizations like medicine are begging those questions all the time. Of course there are issues in the third world, there are issues. There are people with chronic psychosis, some of them have HIV psychosis, HIV dementia, you know, there are many things. Uh, asylums in third world countries are appalling places with no family. Of course, all those, those things need help. Basic, uh, some basic psychiatric drugs, those things, yes. But I'm suggesting that the movement for global mental health is proceeding without local voices um, having much of a say on the matter. They present themselves as, this is a, you know, this is a modernist movement. They need what we have. What does this mean? They need, do they, they need to have the diagnosis of depression and then along come the antidepressants when you can't even agree about what value they are here. So this is a, this is obviously the evangelical thing that I think is deeply, deeply problematic. And above all, owes so little to uh, local people and indeed to the, the uh, methodological approaches of anthropology, uh, which are fundamentally different from, from myths, aren't they? They are much more collectivist, you start with the informs, you move forward, whereas our traditions are about the individual. The other thing is what is neglected are the range of, of healing methods. What do you feel about them? From witch doctors to wise old women, traditional birth, birth attendants, bone centers. When I was a bush doctor in Zimbabwe at the end of the war, we were in professional competition with the witch doctors all the time. And patients switched between the two. And responsible parents, I was a pediatrician, would take their doctor, their, their sick, dying, dying children, to the witch doctor and to us. And